got to fight your way out of it. One of the popular ones was a real fine trip wire across these trails, which is uh, real, like a piano wire. You couldn't see it if you weren't looking for it. And they would put that out at about ankle high, and it would, when you hit it, you would pull the pin on of a grenade which was tied to a tree right beside it. And of course, it, it wouldn't kill a lot of people, it, or might not kill anybody, but it damn sure injure a few. They sent us south and we got into what was called, uh, what was north of Saigon a ways, and if I remember right, uh, in the, of the rubber plantations, where the, a lot of rubber raised over there in Vietnam. And uh, that would be kind of like raising fruits, trees, orchards around here, but they were huge. And, you know, they tap these trees for the sap or the rot rosin or something to make tires. Uh, there was a lot of battles going on in there. That was not, that was more where you could see what was going on instead of in a heavy crowded forest, jungle. A uh, little different type of fighting over there than that. And then after that, we went, um, we were moved south into the delta. And that was all rice paddies. And we happened to be there in the dry season. They have a monsoon season and a dry season. And during the monsoon season, every day at four o'clock it rains. Just set your clock or your watch by it because uh, four o'clock it's gonna start raining. It'll rain for 20 minutes and the sun will come back out and life goes on. But uh, then we went, all the women in, the, in Vietnam did the work. The, old, the men were supposed to be in the army. There wasn't any young men there, just the women and the real old men. And most of them, I don't know how old they really were, but they, they looked like they were really old. Uh, but the women did all the work of harvesting that rice and uh, putting it up. And then they did it in the most primitive ways because they had no machinery. And uh, after that, then we went, we were east of Saigon in a pineapple plantation for quite a while. And these pineapples grow, they, they had built what looked like real small roads with ditches beside them. And uh, the Vietnamese or the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese that were around, they would booby trap these little ro trails and the, on the pineapples so we would have to go crossways. And there's water in the ditches because the tide comes in every night, in the middle of the night, and floods this area. And then, uh, and of course, this, what made it really bad living there was this, Saigon had no sewer system. They ran all their sewage into the river, which flowed into this, out into these pineapple plantations, and then when the tide came in at night off the ocean, it would, uh, wash everything out to sea. So when we would be camped out there on those little burns, they were probably four foot above the, the lay of the land, and they were full of pineapples. But you'd have to camp out there because you're there at night, and about two o'clock in the morning, you gotta get up, pack all your stuff up, and stand up because the water's coming. Otherwise, you've been laying in the the water and the sewage. And we had a lot of guys get hepatitis. That was a real problem because uh, you're living in filth. But that was some of the worst traveling over there because it was like walking up and out of a ditch all day long for mile after mile because you walk into the water, up the ditch, step down on the, over this thing and you're just going crossways. Uh, now was that because it was so flat, was that a safer place to be than the jungle? 
uh, yeah, you're not going to get ambushed out there because you can see what's well ahead of you. Okay. You would get hurt from the booby traps that were, and that's why we didn't walk down laterally down, like walking down the road. You're crossing, uh, it's like cornrows that were built up in the air, oh, five or six feet. Because when these bombing runs, if, if they were suspected to be there, the United States would make a B-52 bombing run in those areas. And these big B-52s would drop these 500 pound bombs which would dig a hole on flat land. It would dig a hole about the size of a, a big municipal swimming pool every time it hit. And if you were to uh, fall, let's say if it started in Iowa Falls, one jet could dump until he got to Alden. And they'd fly more than one jet at a time, but they'd fly it over 40,000 feet and start dropping these things. And it would just shake the whole world when those things would go off. Because they just started falling and they would fall about a quarter mile apart when they actually hit the ground. And in the south, on the flat land, when those bombs would hit, then they would fill up with fresh water. So when we would get to those spots, we never got clean clothes or showers for, well, it'd be once a month at best, maybe once every six weeks you would get clean clothes because that's about how long uh, these army fatigues will last. And they're really a heavy clothes, but if you never change your clothes and never take them off, but you sweat continuously into them, the salt will eventually tear the rot so, the clothes. So you would go sometimes 30 days or, or even up to six weeks before you took a shower or a bath. And there was no place to do it. But when we would hit these, uh, where the bombs, bombing runs had taken place, we'd set up our defense perimeter and the rest of us could go get in those. They were just like big swimming pools with crystal clear, uh, wasn't salt water, it was fresh water. And you got a chance to actually clean up. <laughs> to, you know. We thought it was great. Others would say, you know, not so. Tell me about the time that you were in camp and you would pick the kids up and take them up to get to the medical doctors. Uh, I remember one time we got resupplied and if there was sea rations that some people didn't like, we'd throw them away, but you were supposed to uh, puncture the can with your with your bayonet so that it would rot and the enemy wouldn't be able to take it and use it. Or a, a knife or whatever. You're supposed to open those cans anyway. I remember one time we were throwing some sea rations away. People were that didn't, that things they didn't want. And some of these things were pretty bad. Uh, some of them were packaged after, uh, right after World War II but they'll keep forever. So, but anyway, this little Vietnamese kid, and those people didn't, you know, they didn't have much, but he stuck his finger in to get, see what was in that can, and as he pulled his finger out, he sliced it, really cut himself deep, just pulled the skin back like a fillet off his finger. And I saw it happen, and I just felt sorry this could be for him. And he didn't whimper, didn't cry, I mean, that was, just the way they were that was going to do them no good. So I took him to the, we had doctors and medics with us. One doctor and every platoon, every squad had a medic. And so I found the first one and it happened to be the head doctor. And I said, we got to sew this little kid up. If you can't leave him like that, he'll lose the end of his finger. Well, doctor said, he got it. He said, he don't weigh, but 40 pounds, he said, we can't give him all of our anesthetic, anesthetic was a form of morphine, but it was a self-injecting syringe. And you got the full dose regardless. You just stab yourself with it and it automatically went off and, and you know, somebody really, really needing a painkiller. He said, that will kill him, that's way too much. He, uh, and I said, well, tough as he is, we've we got to do something. We try and sew him up. 
So that little kid held his hand out, and that doctor stitched him up all the way around that finger, and it was, I'll bet it took 15 stitches to sew that finger back. And he, that kid never flinched, uh, never cried, never, it's just like he was totally anesthetized. And all of his other little buddies that were around him were just chattering like chipmunks. And, you know, it really made you feel good. He did a little something of value for him. Uh, but that was one that boy he, give you. He, uh, he wanted to thank me with, with something. And the only possession that little kid had was like a Cracker Jacks toy uh, on a string, some little animal or plastic animal. And uh, he, he wanted to give me that. I hated to take it from him because that's all he had. But it was, in his world, it was the, all he could do to say thank you. And I carried that all the rest of the, my tour over there. Plus, uh, I brought it home and I still have it. You spent your year in Vietnam. And you've had some close calls. And finally, you get notice you're going home. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking? Oh, it's the happiest day of your life. I probably was more concerned and more afraid then than I was when I was actually out there because I was, I knew I was going home, I knew I was going to get married when I got home, and uh, life, was, my, life was ahead of me. You know, I, all my obligations were fulfilled and I was in, basically unharmed at that point. And, okay, Tom, you have a bronze star for Ballard. How did you receive that? Um, <laughs> I'm not going to get into anything about why I got it. Uh, I haven't even told my wife why I have it, That's but it's it's there. It's it's for a heroism act, uh, and besides that, is an, an another award called an Army Archom Medal. Uh, similar, but I don't know why why they dif differentiate between one or the other. The, uh, I'm very proud of them, but it's, that's as far as I'm going to go. I don't know if I've ever told you this, that when dad came home with cancer mm -hmm. and he called me in and he said, I've got three weeks, but you're going to tell everybody I've got six months. And he says, I've got no complaints. And he's told me that. He wanted two things. He's asked God for two things in life. One that his kids be born healthy, and the second one that he didn't have to bury his son from Vietnam. And he got his wishes. That's true. The hardest part, emotionally, of the whole trip was to leave your dad and your mother crying on the driveway as we drove away because they they didn't know whether I was they were going to see me again or not or I'd ever be able to talk to them. Um. Tom returned home, married, raised his family, and now farms in the Hubbard area. Tom Ingerbritson, a Vietnam soldier and American veteran.